What we know today is chemistry has its roots in a much stranger science, alchemy. Less periodic tables and Bunsen burners, more potions to cure all diseases will make you live forever. Cooler, but ultimately less scientific. This word, alchemy, is derived from an Arabic word which many linguists believe comes from an ancient Greek word which itself came from what the ancient Egyptians called Egypt. Chem, meaning blackness, and probably referring to the dark, fertile soil of the Nile River Valley. The word chemistry then can be traced all the way back to the Egyptian art. And that's what chemistry was seen as back in ancient Egypt. A sort of bohemian art form, practiced by specialist priests in long white robes that ironically weren't too dissimilar from lab coats. So what do we know today about chemistry 5,000 years ago? Now a lot of ancient Egyptian chemistry was pretty practical. For instance, they knew how to extract copper from its oxide and sulfide ores, smelting the materials in cute little pedal controlled furnaces to get a pure form of metal for tools and weapons. They also knew how to make alloys, for instance mixing tin and copper to produce the sturdier bronze, an excellent material for stabbing things and people. And whilst the ancient Egyptians didn't invent most of these techniques, they did use them for some of history's most egotistically decorative pieces for instance, shaping gold into fancy masks for corpses. We also have ancient Egypt to thank for making the first paper, by soaking strips of the papyrus plant in water before weaving them together. And they were among the first civilizations to mass manufacture glass. In fact, entire factories will be dedicated to crushing quartz pebbles and mixing them with plant ash before melting the combination into molten glass, where it could be turned into colored beads and amulets for the overly wealthy. Now these exploits were all well and good, but ancient Egyptian chemistry truly excelled elsewhere. Not in the anodyne world of metals, paper and glass, no, in booze. Fermentation was discovered prior to the ancient Egyptian era as an accidental byproduct of harvesting grain. But the Egyptians, much like their modern day counterparts here in Britain, were dogmatically serious about alcohol. They opened up breweries and vineyards all over the place, and they were pretty damn effective. In fact, one recently discovered brewery, dating all the way back to 3000 BC, was able to produce 22,000 litres of beer at a time, which, to put that into perspective, could sustain my immediate family for over three weeks. In breweries like this, wheats would be mixed with water to create a mash, which was then poured into vats and heated to ferment, where microorganisms like yeast and bacteria would convert the grain's carbohydrates into alcohol. Now how much of that the Egyptians understood is beside the point. What they knew was that the thick, brothy liquid at the end of the process brought them closer to God. You see, beer was absolutely integral to Egyptian religion and culture. The workers constructing the pyramids were given daily rations. The beverage was appropriately represented with a divine goddess, Nephthys, and every year people would celebrate the festival of drunkenness, which involved the mythological story about how beer saved the world and, according to some historians, orgies. Wine, on the other hand, formed one of Egypt's most lucrative trade offerings, and five specific wines were even selected as essential provisions for the afterlife, meaning people who could afford it would be buried alongside this sort of set menu of booze. So it's clear that early forms of chemistry affected ancient Egyptian trade, religion, culture, and industry, but probably their most surprising use of it was the creation of cosmetics. As early as 3000 BC, the ancient Egyptians created the first synthetic paint pigment, known now as Egyptian blue. Creating this would have required heating quartz sand, a copper compound, calcium carbonate, and an alkali at around 1000 degrees Celsius for several hours. So it's striking that so much work went into creating a pretty color for their kitchenware. But the ancient Egyptians did seem to care a lot about aesthetics, about being the world's fanciest, sexiest alcoholics. Alongside paints and dyes, they also also produced the world's first perfumes and makeup, fitting for a society that was transparent and open about sexuality. Ancient Egyptian culture was pretty sex positive, full of innuendo and extramarital relationships. According to many sources, they may have even been open and accepting of homosexuality, so it's not really a surprise that they used chemistry to make themselves hotter. Nowhere is this more visible than the chemically enhanced appeal of Cleopatra. Famous for her beauty, Cleopatra made use of myrrh and cinnamon perfume, gold sprinkled eyeshadow shadow, lead and animal fat mascara, and even nail polish to accentuate her appearance. All of which would have been created through complex and painstaking chemical processes. And it's worth remembering that in 47 BC, with Egypt in the throes of a civil war between Cleopatra and her brother, history was pretty much hinging on Cleopatra's ability to seduce Roman dictator Julius Caesar and consolidate Egypt's relationship with Rome. So their meeting, aided no doubt by Cleopatra's avant-garde makeup, is a rare 
rare reminder of chemically augmented flirtation changing the course of global history. From swords and scrolls to big boozed up orgies and tantalising perfumery, the fascinating and widespread use of chemistry in ancient Egypt reveals not just the enormous scale of scientific history, but the remarkable creativity of our ancient ancestors. Ancient Egypt may have eventually crumbled into Roman and Byzantine rule, but its scientific exploits have survived into the present. And thank God for that, eh? Thank God for that. Hail, hail Nephthys.